Hi, it's Kathy, and I'm very excited today to share <clears throat> two people from the East Coast, Connecticut, who are doing great work in the area of recovery and addiction. So first I wanted to introduce Anna Gopian, who has a, a woman in recovery, and she, after 26 years in a corporate career, Anna has transitioned all her energies into her new business, which is Tri-Circle Inc. And it's three-phase creation and tri-circle restoration LLC, the creator of the paraphernalia project. And these companies exist to support the solutions, education, and resources needed in Connecticut communities. So welcome, Anna. Really Thank glad you. to have you. And we also have Ken Carnes, who worked for the state of Connecticut Department of Correction for 27 years. And Ken has owned and operated his own computer business, Computer Works, since 1999. He most recently began co-facilitating a hope and support group for Tri-Circle Inc. in Southern Connecticut. He's the proud father and grandfather and a lifelong resident of Connecticut. Um, so welcome to you, Ken, too. And uh, really appreciate both of you taking time to come. So maybe we'll start with Anna. If you could just tell me a little bit about what Tricircle is for people that don't know about it and what is the work that you're doing. All right. That's um, going to try to condense a lot of stuff into one, um, you know, a little brief clip. And then if the questions ever come up, people can reach out to me or to you, however. Mm -hmm. um, Tricircle is actually has a lot of meaning behind it. The three and the intentions of that came about because as a woman in recovery and needing support, 26, a little more than 26 years ago, uh, July 13th, 1995, I wonder how things might be different. But I, I look back, I don't stare, right? So I know things could have been different um, if they were different um, regarding my family and the information they had in support and the stigma and the language and how substance use disorders and mental health was looked at. So I'm, that's the main focus for TriCircle is to really bring things in and look at it systemically. So um, I, I know I had written a lot and there's 15 monthly support groups now and there's uh, nine of them starting October, Hope and Support Groups, and then six, unfortunately, but very fortunately, Hope After Loss Groups because it's another community that really needs to have a different kind of support and then we can talk about their loved ones so they're not gone in vain and then we can build their experiences into the solutions as well because they have just as much value to me the parents guardians and loved ones of someone that has died due to a substance use disorder but we have clinical services now and we're moving towards our long-term goal of a 15-month residential program that's the eye on the prize for me right there so Wonderful. that's the short skinny <laughs> No, that's great. I really like that. And I like, and I love it when you said 15 months. I said, yes. Yes. Because, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's really great to extend the time. I think one of the things that I've noticed too with parents that they try to just get it in, get it over with, and, you know, maybe 30 days or, you know, a short amount of period. And then you kind of get the revolving door of kids that, you know, are re relapsing, that kind of thing. So, and you know, you have that lived experience. I mean, I've admired your work since I started doing this in 2013 and oh. reached out to you multiple times and had guided parents to you, even to read your information. It's just such a, a great value to all that need to know about the disease of addiction and resources and support and craft too. I'm going to promote craft. Right. Yeah, craft I is believe. helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, and Ken, would you like to just share a little bit about your story and what brought you here? Sure. So, you know, a little over three years ago, maybe about four years ago, uh, you know, I had a loved one. I had my son uh, was a heroin addict and, and I found out very surprisingly um, by accident. And, you know, when I started, when I was starting there, I made every mistake possible. Like I did not do one thing right. Uh, from the beginning with him, um, but I did it purely out of love. You know, I loved him. I wanted to get him help and didn't understand how could this happen. I thought it was my fault. Like it must have been something I did or didn't do enough of. And, and, and it took me, you know, uh, probably about six times of getting him to detox where one finally s stuck, where he actually stayed uh, and it was a 30 days and he was clean and sober. And at that time, you know, this facility said, hey, 
the best place for him is California because they have all this sober living out there. So let's buy him a plane ticket and send. So I didn't know any difference. I said, sure, here, here's my credit card, get him out there. Uh, and, you know, he did well for about 90 days out there. Uh, and then he started relapsing. Mm -hmm. And, and, for a year, I was spending a year flying back and forth to California, getting him into treatment, like finding him, getting him into a detox center and, you know, being relieved. And I would fly home. By the time I got off the plane, I would get a message saying he's already gone. He already left, you know. So um, there was just so much going on in that year. And I really, you know, d didn't know who to go to, who to turn to. Um, I found a local group, I found TriCircle, and with, uh, it took a lot for me. I watched every month, every two weeks, there was a meeting, and I said, I'm going to go to that one, and that Thursday would come, and I didn't go. So it probably took another three months for me to finally say, you know, I have to do something, and I attended my first meeting, and it and it started, it started my recovery, it started my healing from being addicted to to my loved one who was an addict. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was a life changer for me and, and started learning and, you know, meeting other parents that were in the same situ situation as I was and helping me navigate what I should be doing, what I shouldn't be doing. And, you know, that, that was, that, that literally changed my life, you know, in so many ways from where I thought, you know, when something like this and, 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 you hear this from so many parents that when this comes to you or comes to your family, you're shocked. I mean, it's a complete, it's a game change, changes your life. Whether you want to say it will or it won't, the addiction in your family completely changes your life and the direction of your life and, and, and what you do. So um, that's how I've ended up, you know, here with TriCircle. And now, you know, um, as you mentioned earlier, uh, co-facilitating, you know, a paraprofessional, uh, you know, hope and support groups, trying to give back, trying to help people who were once in my position when I first started, just trying to help them navigate and, and, and not make as many mistakes as I did. Oh, that's great. And I know it's, um, it's a journey for all of us parents, but I think support groups are so helpful. You know, I think helping you're able to meet new people. You're able to get low. I think for your area, you, you sound like your groups are all in, in, close proximity so you're able to share resources and um and just not feel so alone i think that's one of the huge yeah. pieces and and you're right i mean just listening to other people's stories and what they've done or haven't done you kind of learn for yourself what you think might work for you so well wonderful and awesome that you're giving back this way this is great um, all right, so one of the topics we thought we'd mention is talking about dad's roles in this. So you're a perfect example of a dad who has stepped up and is, you know, really trying to help. Um, what can you say, either one of you say about uh, dads and how we can encourage more dads? I think many dads are uh, very interested for sure of what's going on with their kids. And there are a number of dads like, like Ken who are very active. I know there's a, quite a few dads that I've met online that, you know, have websites or blog posts or they, you know, they, um, I volunteer for the parent, the partnership to end addiction and they do parent coaching. And I know there's dads on there too, but I think predominantly in a lot of these meetings, we see moms maybe for the most part. I don't know if that's experience you get. So maybe we can speak to that a little bit and uh, what do you think we could do to encourage dads or what do you think ha goes on for dads when they're faced with their child substance use? You want me to take it for a second? Then I'm going to turn it to you, Ken. How's that? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and again, this is just another reason why I'm so happy Ken was able to join us this morning. And you're correct. I don't think it's um, different East Coast, West Coast. Um, moms do happen to be uh, more prevalent in these groups. And I don't believe it's because they, uh, dads don't care. Definitely not. I just still think there's an additional masculine layer of stigma or however, you know, that whole pink and blue, what happens in the house stays in the house or big boys don't cry and men are fixers and I'm not a man and I'm also not a parent. So let me clarify that. I, I say that straight up in our groups. I'm not a parent. I cannot have children. 
but I have been given the honor and privilege of helping many with theirs. So my lived experience and the diversity in our groups, having two paid professionals, one is licensed and then the paraprofessional, which I and Ken are both, um, we bring a lived experience to the table. So Ken can bring it as a parent and then I can bring it as a woman in long-term recovery and it's really diverse. But when men do come, you know, it's, it's so emotional. It's a very vulnerable place to be. And I think that might have a lot to do with it. And, you know, it, it's like you're tag teaming too. Our hope is just that dads or moms and dads or partners or however that goes, if they can agree to even disagree in certain areas and come together and focus on their loved ones situation and learn their self care, what works for them, they'll be stronger together. And, you know, then they can become the resource out in the community because you hear differently once you get involved and you start taking into consideration new language and your loved one and you're protecting them. So guys are protectors and they're, you know, they can't appear what I think as vulnerable. So I think, I think I'm hitting what Ken is going to expand on. So I'll, I'll turn it over. Uh, well, a couple of things. One, for myself personally, I grew up with addiction in my house. Uh, I had a parent who was, a, who was an alcoholic. And, you know, the golden rule there was never speak about this when you leave this house. You know, no matter everybody in the neighborhood, everyone in like our, that knew our family knew he was an alcoholic, but we never, it was never to be spoken about. You know, you could never mention it. So, you know, growing up with that, it was always, you know, I'm not gonna say anything. So when, it, when I was faced with it, my first reaction was, we're not gonna mention it. It's embarrassing. Um, it, it's, it's a black cloud and we're not gonna, you know, air our dirty laundry to anybody, whether it's a friend, a coworker, uh, even my own siblings, like I never discussed this with. Yeah, I just kept it myself. Um, I was in a position where I was a single father with an absent mother. So I, I was, you know, his only parent. Mm -hmm. um, what I find the most of people I talk to now, because I'm so willing to say, you know, this is where I'm at. This is, you know, this is my life and this is my son and this is what I deal with. People are willing to talk, talk with me. And most of the times, you know, there's not an absent parent and the men say, yeah, my wife or my ex-wife, she goes to meetings she get, and she tells me, you know, this is what we need to do. Like they feel like I'm going to send her to do it because it's embarrassing for me to go do it. So I'll send her and she can tell me what I need to do. And I think the other thing is, and I was a perfect example, one of the reasons, uh, because it's so emotional. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons that I, I, put off going to these meetings because I didn't want to walk in and break down. So the whole way when I finally got to that meeting, I said, I'm going to be strong. I'm not going to do this. And I'll tell you what, you know, I remember that day, Anna saying, you know, would you like to share? And I didn't even get a minute out before I broke down. Right. And I left there feeling relieved. Like I, I, I let this thing out of me, but so embarrassed like i'm so embarrassed i sat here in a blubbered in front of all these people but then as it took time to get to the next meeting uh, i reassessed and i felt you know what it wasn't that bad and there were other people just as upset as i was so maybe it wasn't as embarrassing and i think that was you know the game changer for me to come back to the next meeting two weeks later that i wasn't so embarrassed and you know i don't think i ever shed a tear again in a meeting but i think because i was able to you know i, I just described this relief and i've seen it from other men that show up at the group and i'm surprised they don't come back but when you start to tell the story and the emotion comes out it's almost like releasing something it's almost like there's pressure in something and you're you open it up and it just releases and this gets out and it's almost like that's the beginning of you trying to start healing and i've seen it in other people i felt it in myself i was one of those people who kept coming back and some people don't maybe it wasn't enough for them maybe that's all they needed but yeah yeah and there's no judgment that's what we try to say yeah we no. do believe that the shame and stigma and guilt are just as detrimental as the disease itself. And when it isolates or separates us from solutions or support, I think that's the disease, right? So I'm always looking at to um, differentiate 
what's really going on, you know? And is it the, what's happening or the old wound it may mirror? Like with Ken's case, it's an older wound that it mirrored. And then in involving in here for his son, maybe he's believing he's there for his son, it became the self care and what he needed for himself. Mm -hmm. And usually when parents change, their loved ones change because they're hip to what's going on. And they're like, hey, are you still going to those meetings? Or, hey, why are you going to those meetings? Or, you know what I mean? It's all of a sudden the meeting becomes the problem because they're becoming more able to um, communicate. Who are they communicating with? Are they communicating with the disease or their loved one? Mm -hmm. And then how do you respond versus react? And craft was a, a great help for me with learning how to do that and allowing that unconditional love and really um, helping and supporting them to make their own decisions. Because what I see parents regularly doing, and I know it's out of love, um, is that they wanna do it for them, right? They wanna fix it. And I think for me personally on the outside, looking in in this case, I think what I hear is I can't do it for myself. And, and it minimized me. And I, I just think they wanted it to go away as fast as possible too, you know? And there's some of that I understand, but there's so much more that even what Ken has learned and many other people have learned within our groups, if they come back or not, I know they're different from being there and that they become of a greater purpose in life, which is really a, a, a huge component to any human being however they may be utilized so these are skills that you can use in other areas of your life as well great point so i can i like the idea too that you mentioned you know the emotions that dad that's a good very good point that the emotions dad don't dads don't maybe want to go to some of these meetings or reach out because they get the emotions will bubble up and i think so many dads have been trained for you know as young children that you know you don't cry as you said you don't you know you you stuff it and you just keep it inside. And so it's easier sometimes to let the moms go ahead and, and take the reins on this. So good point, both of you. And um, I think the more, we, of course, that we reach out and get help, always it's better. It's not helpful, as you both know, to, to isolate or to try to keep it quiet. And I think many of us have who have, you know, people in our lives previously who had addiction issues. That was sort of the mode too. We don't, you know, we don't tell the neighbors about this. We don't talk mm -hmm. about it. And that's a whole nother issue too. So, okay. So um, on a parents making informed decisions, what do you think helps with that? What can parents do to really get information so that they are making informed uh, decisions? Oh, uh, that's a great question. And it, and it has many facets to it. I'm going to say an informed decision is knowing that you have a choice and your, your place and the responsibility of that choice for you and or your loved one. Um, when I look at resources, that's part of information, right? But how do you decipher something? How do you find something? How do you, um, is there a release signed? Is there harm reduction as part of the component that's happening? Uh, drug test, the possible um, use of that as a, a boundary building and a trust building tool. Not necessarily to catch someone doing something wrong, but to catch them doing something right, mm -hmm. including a medicated assistant therapy. We offer um, 12 panel drug tests at our groups as well, and those for only $5. And MAT um, is on that as well as fentanyl, because sometimes when you're dealing with harm reduction, you got to know what you're dealing with. And unfortunately, it's just so invasive in everything that's out there, no matter the substance. And... You know, an informed decision for me is a parent being able to have the support and kind of tease out other experiences with other parents in the group and being able to go to bed with the decision they made. We don't tell people what to do. It's not our place to do that. But if you're making an informed decision and you can go to bed at night knowing that you did all you can, the disease won't impede on you and wag its finger like you should have known better. Um, that negative self-talk that keeps trying to keep you separated from um, options and choices and um, your own self-care. So informed decisions are really important. And as it comes to the disease of addiction, it, you said earlier, a 30-day program. And to me, that's, that's, not, that's a rest. <laughs> that's a rest, right? And I believe it takes a lot longer than that even to start healing a brain. But what needs to be known is when someone does get out of treatment, their brain and the neurobiology of that has not been healed. 
and it might not even be on that path yet. It could just still be in a very contemplative state. So addiction can be a substance or a behavior. And when it's a substance that gets you to the table and that's put down, you have to be careful that a transfer of addiction might not happen. So those are other red flags that we make people aware of because it can be supplementing and feeding that part of your brain still. And that could be like shopping or gambling or overwork or sex. There's other things behaviorally that can start to, but the pain of those behaviors will get you know, intense. And the only thing that makes that go away is the vicious cycle and the drug. So then it, it traps someone back into the cycle. So a lot of what's happening and all of the um, signs and symptoms even the business of um, urine, like we teach people about, you know, urine that's not theirs or how they stashed urine or how you might find it because a drug test is coming. And if you're utilizing that as a tool, but there's so many things that a lot of folks wouldn't take into consideration, hiding places, you know, a lot of that we talk about, you know, and they're like, I cannot believe that was right in front of me, but not to beat yourself up over it and to take into consideration that, you have something now that can help someone else and, and just really trying to flip it into the purpose, but to make a decision and be able to go at, to bed at night with that decision and know that we're not judging you for that. You know, even your decisions have harm reduction opportunities in it as parents, guardians, and loved ones. You're not going to give them that ultimate $40 number because it, you know what I mean? You might give them $5 and say, I'm sorry and have a response. If you're going to look for something, you're going to ask questions. What are you going to do with the answer? Be prepared prior to asking the question. Be prepared prior to looking for something. That's information that I think can really help someone in a family. Great tips. No, I, I like that. And I think it is, you mentioned harm reduction so helpful. And also the idea that it's not one size doesn't fit all. And you can give the information and people need to apply what makes sense for them. So I think that's, that's really good. Okay, so can we talk, one of the other things we want to um, touch on is self-care. So I thought I'd ask you this one. So what are some things that you do and how do you help yourself as far as getting through? I know it's stressful and it's challenging and parents get depressed and anxious and all these different things. So what helps you with self-care? So my self-care started, uh, I started walking. So I started walking and I started listening to books and podcasts and I never stopped walking. I'm like the Forrest Gump of walking, right? So I literally rain, snow, sleet. I walk four miles a day. Uh, no matter no matter what is going on in my life, where I am, if I'm at a hotel, if I'm anywhere, I at some point of that day I walk. Um, and beyond that, I'm probably um, you know not the traditional male because I started getting massages. I started thinking, what can I do to take care of myself to make myself feel better? I started getting massages. I, I, people in my life are going for these mani pedis. I said, you know what, I'm going to try one of those, you know, and it was a fantastic experience. And I tell all my friends and they laugh at me, but I'm like, you don't know what you're missing. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, so as far as self-care, I took it to a whole other level. Um, I started playing golf. I learned how to play golf. So that started out, you know, I found some friends that played and I didn't, you know, I was just starting out. I borrowed some clubs from somebody and I started. So, you know, three years later, I'm still playing golf. I'm still walking four miles a day. Uh, I try to get a massage once a month. I get a mani-pedi once a month, you know, so with <laughs> anything I can do, you know, it's really to take care of my, because well, nobody else is going to take care of me. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I have so many friends who I was one of those people, you know, working, working, working and just no self-care, whether whether it had to do with with, uh, you know, addiction in your family or not or things you need. We all we all have these stresses in our life. My stress was was, you know, my my you know, loved one who was in, who was in, in addiction. And, I, you know, I have other friends that have other stresses, which is equal to my stress. You know, and I think we all need self-care. No matter what, I think everybody needs to find the things that make them feel good, relax them, give them things to look forward to. Um, these are the things just, you know, no one can take care of us like we can take care of ourselves. 
uh, and we know what's best, what our body tells us what we need. Uh, and, and believe it or not, when I said earlier that this whole journey um, changed my life from that day I found out about my loved one, but not only did it change my life, it's made me healthier. Like I really took, looked inward and started really taking care of myself. So a lot of things that I've done on this journey, a lot of it was making me a better person and a healthier person. No. Good. No, I like that. And I like that you're stepping outside the box. You've got, you sound, you've got some courage and creativity there. And so I think that's yeah. good. And walking, I know is great. I do that too. And I know a lot of other people do that as well. Um, and just anything, I think the physical, you know, outlet is so important. It gets your endorphins going and all of that. Okay. We offer our website or our link, I should say, for our Zoom meetings, because we're virtual as well as in person. Uh -huh. We make sure, um, I utilize what I call the gratitude list. So the gratitude list is in between meetings. So we're able to put like, oh, I'm probably the only one that doesn't. Everybody reads my stuff, but and it's okay. Um, it's a platform where I personally put three to five things that I'm grateful for. And sometimes it's where I put resources that made it came up in a group. And then people could, um, you know, utilize it from that platform. So there's like 144 people in that CC list which that's where we also put our Zoom links. It's not like a public access thing. You'd have to contact me for hope and support. And then uh, Christine Gagnon, she would be the one you contact for hope after loss. Ooh. So yeah, but the gratitude list, it really can be something you refer back to in the course of a day when somebody has crossed your path and not made you so happy. So you're like, oh, that's right. That's right. I cooked the la 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 and I'm going to have that when I go home for dinner, you know? So it's just really a great thing to have to resource in the rest of your day. And remember, it's the little things. It's the little things. Absolutely. Yeah. And I like the gratitude list or sometimes what I'll do too is, you know, what went well this week in a group I have. Because, you know, you need to start training your brain. We're all so focused on the negative. And I think if you can find those positive things that are going on in your life, it makes you just feel so much better. You know, otherwise you just feel like you're kind of drowning with all this so we have fun events so sorry but like setback things that are outside of addiction because right. even the listening and reading and that's all great but if you go deep into that you're just transferring your addiction in a matter of speaking you're still tangled with the disease so we have setback tournaments and we do all kinds of fun events and you know so that's super cool too that's great so speaking of that so Anna, can you touch a little bit on how addiction affects family members? Um, what is your experience with that? And how can families help themselves, parents or other siblings too, which I think are greatly affected when a loved one has addiction issues? Well, I, I present myself as someone in recovery and I personally was given, I'll say the honor and privilege of taking my mother to treatment when she had reached out. I think after watching a little bit more than a year of me doing what I was doing, and it's scary no matter who you are in a family system, but when you get into the process and people start watching, you also shift the dynamic and you make work for other people if you pull out to what became the norm over time, right? So family system to me is really super important. And when we break it down, even in the groups, are there other um, siblings, the invisible siblings that have been uh, not tossed aside, but really not the highest priority? And they're, you know, shooting and because some of our group members are, are siblings. They're not just parents and guardians. They're siblings and they've been, you know, they felt cast aside or compared or the person with a substance use disorder compares themselves to the other sibling. And that the disease uses that to keep them separated. But when I always joke, and it's not funny, it is to me, but because of who I am in my life, it's tough raising parents. <laughs> and... Uh, I remember taking on responsibilities and I'm sure Ken understood that too because we've had people that weren't capable of doing it for us and we were threatened. So if the hierarchy of needs in life aren't being met um, and that shifts the dynamic, we, I call it tuck and roll, right? I was the only girl that played football in uh, the neighborhood. So you learn how to tuck and roll in a circumstance. So when a life presents, no matter of your age, animalistically we fight flight or freeze or fight flight or freeze into a circumstance our amygdala is up and we are going to get out of the situation unfortunately as humans we don't just put it down 
shake it off like a deer and, and move into life, we take the story with us. And then it slowly um, separates us. So family is an interesting thing in my work on myself as in, uh, in recovery and you know outside professional help and different kinds of recovery pathways. I now can say that biology does not equate unacceptable behavior. And just because I'm related to you doesn't mean it's okay or necessary for me to show up all the time. And if I do, I know it's okay to show up for an hour or two and leave or go with someone to make it a safe environment. So I could speak on that behalf because even for a parent, they might not want to have to field questions about their child. You know, hey, how's so-and-so doing? Like on the side, like it's this big secret. Uh, they're, they're doing their best they can in their recovery. I'm sure he would appreciate a phone call <laughs> or something. You know what I mean? It's not like, there's no elephants in my room. So sometimes people might not like what I say. And I wonder if it's what I say or what I say is true that bothers them more. So it's okay. I, I can't be friends with everybody. And, uh, but biology doesn't make me um, have to do anything. You know, I, I love, I love deeply, and that's what sometimes makes it uncomfortable to make some of these decisions. If I didn't care, it wouldn't even be uncomfortable. So I, I know I come from a place of love, and, and that's super important. Mm -hmm. That's good. And I, uh, you know, I think your groups too, I, I love the idea that you have siblings coming and that you are reaching out and, you know, having the whole family be part of it because it does affect everybody, you know, and I think siblings especially feel so powerless with the whole, the whole thing. Um, and then it gets into the partners or spouses to the, you know, as you mentioned, I think we talked about before, you might not always agree on how you're going to go forward. And then that whole opens up a whole nother you know, issue, but collaboration is, is good. And if parents can learn to work together and I think probably group going to your groups and learning what, how other couples have done it and all that kind of thing is good. So finally, Ken, maybe you could speak a little bit about how you have felt and the importance of having people to connect with, having people to talk to, how has this helped you? And how do you think you feel that it helps other people that, you know, can come to these groups or to any group and, and connect with others? Um, you know, again, as we talked about earlier, the stigma of not saying anything, I think for myself to be able to start opening up with the people around me, um, I really expected like negative feedback, like, you know, almost treat me like, you know, there's addiction in his family, we'll stay away from him, that type of thing. And, and people were very welcoming. And what I learned uh, and what I've learned through this whole journey, and, and you know, this is a, a saying through tri-circle, but uh, everybody knows someone. No matter who I talk to, everybody's my uncle, my father, my brother, my cousin, no matter who, who, perfect strangers. I'll, I could go sit down to eat somewhere and somebody will sit next to me and I'll start discussing and they'll be like, oh yeah, my wife or my sister or my son. Or So it, it's, it's no matter who, who you speak to out there, everybody knows somebody. And I think it's become so, so much easier. It just shows how, how big addiction is right now. Um, but it, it, there, there's no holds bar. Like I have conversations with people all the time. I'll tell them exactly what I went through, exactly, you know, what I've been through with my son. And, and sometimes I go back to, you know, with my father growing up, you know, in a household, I'll discuss, you know, from where, where my whole life I was programmed never to mention this. I freely talk about it. And I think it helps other people. It helps other people open up, especially other males will, will start opening up to me saying, well, and, and, and I know they start to feel a little better just being able to have somebody to talk about it. Um, so I, I think just being able, just being open to communication with other people and just being able to tell your story or, or you know, admit to other people what's going on with you people people are drawn right in there i've spoken with so many people more people than i have ever would have spoken with in my life right just because you know they'll hear me speaking about this at, at, you know and and with my business um you know i go to people's houses i go to places of business and i work on computers i become friends with people and and we'll start having discussions and it's just unbelievable 
how many of my customers have somebody directly in their family. And, and a couple of them, I think, have called me back, you know, for such a minor thing on their computer. But if we've spent an hour talking about their loved one who is in active, active addiction, you know, and, you know, offering them resources or places to go or think they, they may never get to a meeting. But I mean, I, I think that's the goal at the end is to help them, you know, not just me, but to, 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 you know, being able to share this and share their experiences with other people just like themselves. Yeah. Very true. I know. Isn't it funny how you just go, you know, do an errand or I just reached out for some, a service recently. And next thing you know, the mom has a teenage son who's struggling with addiction. It's yeah. just, like, it's, you know, it just feels like it's everywhere. So um, thank you both, both so much for coming on. Where can people um, learn more? Um, it's your, uh it's in the Con connecticut areas your group but well, why don't you go ahead and explain that where can people learn more and where can they go to attend your meetings i will also link all of this below but maybe just an overview excellent and, and ken uh, posted his short video that we're using psas and i think i, I attached one of mine as well uh, tricircleinc.com is the website our meetings right now, um, depending on the meeting, the kind of meeting it is, we have 15 monthly support groups. Um, nine of them are hope and support and six of them are hope after a loss. So Anna at tricircleinc.com is how you would get an invite into one of our meetings and become part of the gratitude list, CC list. Um, there's at no cost to anyone. Um, some of our meetings are now back to face-to-face -face, and wherever they are face-to-face, -face, we include the virtual component, we kept it some are still looking for new locations so um but events activities most of it's on our website so you know you can always just reach out look on the facebook page message us you know we're pretty responsive in that regard sounds good well thank you both great to meet you both and thank you so much for sharing and i do appreciate the work you're doing i know it really helps families and it's so needed as you both know it's just an ongoing problem so you're helping to to change uh, people's lives and spread awareness and, and move them into a better direction. So all of that is so positive. So thanks you again. Too. Yeah, thanks Thank again you. for spending time. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, Kathy. Bye.